there's this quote that says there's no pain like a story inside you uh, left untold. It's the story inside of you you're meant to share. It's just to be your truest self. Hey everyone, it is Angie Wachowski. I'm so excited to be here on the Bet on You program. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I have the amazing privilege of just talking to incredible people to guide us all in developing the three C's of risk-taking. That is really the spirit of season four, the three C's of risk-taking, having the clarity, courage, and confidence we need to pursue our dreams. So I'm going to kick off this next episode before I introduce our guest with a story. Uh, In 2022, I made a really important decision. I stepped away from a business I had been building for almost two decades. Nothing was wrong with the business, but there had been something changed within me. I wanted to develop my personal brand. You see, when you're, you know, developing a business and you're co-authoring books, you're sharing your voice. And I felt that at this stage in my life, I had a story to tell. But here was the problem. I didn't know really what it was, but I knew that there was something inside of me that I wanted to share, that I wanted to express that was going to be completely self-authored. So I turned to the best. I turned to Chris West. I'd heard about Chris and his work with video narrative. I thought, sure, I'd love to have from a promotional perspective, some video to help me better tell my story, whatever that story was going to be. I was not expecting Chris to come into my life and really pull out my vision for myself and the clarity that really resulted in this video that turned out just incredible. If you've seen it, it's like a Nike video. Like he he captured just my vision and my dreams of myself. And he was really my guide in through the storytelling process. And I credit Chris with so much of all the success I experienced today because he helped me in so many ways find my truth about me. Isn't that kind of funny? Like I'm a 40 year old woman, almost 47. We'll be 48 pretty soon. I got to learn at this stage in my life, the truth about me. But I feel like that's the work (laughs) that we're all supposed to do right now. You know, think back, like in my 20s, I was hustling hard. I know you were probably too. I was just trying to get my feet underneath me firmly in my career. In my 30s, I was raising kids. I was, you know, baking treats for school events while traveling with my client events. I didn't really have the time or the luxury of time to really turn inward and think, are you happy? Are you okay? You know, in some 40s, I went through some pretty significant transformations. I think the most important was I went through a divorce. And talk about stepping outside your life and saying, well, my gosh, my identity for nearly 20 years was with somebody. Who am I now by myself? And, you know, through the process of self-discovery, realized yet again that I really had a story to tell and I just needed some help. Chris is going to help us all better understand how to tell our story in our conversation. Again, we're about to talk with Chris West of Video Narrative. Hey there, everyone. I am with Chris West and I was so excited to have him here because he has played a just pivotal role in helping me better tell my story in this era of my life. So I'm sure that a conversation for you listeners is going to help inspire you to develop your story, live your story, get the courage, clarity, confidence you need to bet on yourself. So Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks, Angie. It's so good to be with you. It's so good to be with everyone who's listening right now. I'm excited. I'm excited. I want to hear about your background before we jump into the type of work that you do. So do you mind talking a little bit about your story up until this point? I think the the best thing to share is that there was a moment in my time where I learned something that I wish every person on the planet could learn. And that is that I was in graduate school studying narrative therapy, and I was doing like a research project on the way the brain processes uh, long-term memory. And I learned from a neuroscientist in one of the the books I was doing research on, one of the top uh, neuroscientists in the United States, who said, we're actually not quite sure why, but we do know this is the case now, that the only time that the brain all the systems come online and integrate is when it's hearing a story. And, and I remember the moment in time where I was at the coffee shop, the, the, the actual steam coming off the coffee, the way the light slanted in. I could remember everything because that moment just slowed down to me and almost everything stopped around me because I realized that if that's the case, then there should never be a time where we want someone to remember anything we say 
it, and not share a story. And yet very few people do, including parents to kids. If you want your kids to remember something, you don't tell them the thing to do. You tell them a story. They will remember that story for the rest of their lives, right? But unfortunately, most people don't tell a story with their brand. They don't tell a story with their life and they don't share stories whenever they're about to give a presentation, whether that's on a Zoom meeting or whether it's on an actual keynote stage. And so uh, that was where everything started for me. I, I was doing that research. I was in graduate school. A speaker asked me to do a, a video for him. I turned it into a story. It got shown that year at a national conference where speakers meet. It was reviewed as the top uh, video, one of the most effective videos of that year. And then all of a sudden, thought leaders started calling me. And I was studying to be a therapist, but I found way more joy in helping people tell their story and create alignment in their personal lives around their brand that would affect thousands of other lives than sort of sitting in a counseling chair all day talking about, you know, people's parents' issues because, uh, it's all the same thing. We all we all <laughs> got to go back to our childhood. That's the whole thing. And so, anyways, so people tend to say, "I, you know, on our first conversations, wow, I don't know why I'm crying." And I, everybody has their energy in the world. That's just ten. I've just been a listener my whole life, and I took that narrative therapy skill and turned it into personal branding, and have been doing it since 2013. So it's all I do every day. Oh, I, what a joy and a privilege, right, to help people share their story. And as you're talking to, I can't help but laugh because certainly your therapy is still being put to great use, having people tell their stories. And I'd love to hear from you because your work today is you help people develop the clarity around their story and produce amazing products as a result of it, you know, for them in their influencer space. But why do you think we're so bad or maybe not everybody, but some of us. I know for me, I was probably really bad. Uh, but why do you think we're so bad at telling our story? It's so important that we all ask this question because the truth is, is that we don't realize it, but we actually have commitments to safety and and not being in a place of, of, of being vulnerable or failure. We have a much greater commitment to that than we do to living a great story with our lives or taking the risk that we know would bring the most satisfaction. And this is actually studied by um, many, many people, but there's actually two doctors at Harvard who actually have this incredible um, uh, tool that they walk people through called, uh, it's called, it's not resistance to change. It's actually called, um, I just recently did it with this amazing um, thought leader. But essentially, we actually have greater commitments to not taking the risk, to not being vulnerable, to not being out there and failing than we do to actually achieve what we want. And so everybody actually, if they're really quiet, does know what they want to do in their life, does know what they want to do in their business, does know because their body's telling them all the time. But to do so would require so much risk, which is what you talk about, that we have a greater commitment to not failing and not being vulnerable than we do to actually pursue what we truly want. And that is the work to get over for all of us. And that's certainly what you talk about, right? That's exactly what your keynote's it's about. It's the hard work. And I love how you're phrasing that, like the commitment. You know, I've been at this job for 10 years and I've got this degree. And yeah, my heart, my mind are telling me to pursue a very different direction, but this whole sunk cost thinking and I've made these investments. And I think in many ways, those are the lessons, this is the therapy coming and the lessons that we picked up along the way, like, you know, you follow through. And yeah, you've, you, you are following through, you've been following through, but sometimes that just doesn't meet your needs anymore. It can feel selfish to tell your own story and to live your version of your story. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And I'm just, I mean, this is something you do every day. So I'm so interested. I'd love to answer, but what do you... What do you think is the reason we don't do it? And especially how do you, how do you get over it? Cause I, I, this is a, I love the conversation with you and this is your area. So I'm, I'm literally just as interested. I think a lot of us are just really afraid and it's really, you know, we'll say, oh no, I'm not resistant to change. I'm not resistant to change, but no, we are afraid because it's going to require change. And it's not like, you know, you're changing your mailbox. You know, I just got to go to the post office and fill out a form. It's like, actually I need to, maybe it's end a relationship. Maybe it's, I need to cut off this toxic career that I'm in and there's no jobs in my area. And, and those are really big, scary changes, right? And that's stepping into the uncertainty. So when I talk about risk, I talk about stepping into the uncertainty, but it's not like you being at the mercy of a really difficult decision. It's you bringing that uncertainty in your life. It's like, I have a good life. Why am I going to mess it up by pursuing my dreams? 
And that's a great question. Why should, so yeah, I'll ask you since you just asked me the mm -hmm. question, why should we mess it all up to pursue our dreams? Because it's literally the story that we're all here to live. It really is. Is that when we think about our children or the nephews and the nieces or the kids that we see in the world, right? We, we, when we ask, what do we want to see from them? We want them to learn. We want them to grow. We don't want them to do everything safe their whole life, right? But as we get older, we start thinking, well, that's not you know the case for me. The story that we're all here to tell is you know the story many people have heard and it is the story that and we connected on this that I, I send to all of my clients as a gift as we start is the alchemist the reason that uh, when Paulo Coelho at was asked you know why is this now become one of the the most well-known uh, well-read books in the entire world he said you know all I did was sit down and write uh, from my soul and it has now touched so many other people's souls and the soul and the story of that book is simply a boy who is seeking his his treasure, right? And in order to do that, he has to let everything go. And so it also, just again, Angie, it's a stage of development that people don't realize is that right around between ages 35, 36, 37 to 43, it's a stage of development in our life where we start realizing that the way that we were told to do something in the best version of ourselves that our ego could come up with, which was success in the world, that I finally made it. We spent our 20s and early 30s and late, you know, into late 30s and a lot of times into early 40s trying to achieve. And we get to that stage and everybody gets to it somewhere inside there where they go, you know, the F word, this is not working, right? Like this isn't working. I don't feel great all the time and something's got to change. But at that point is right when you talk about you have too much on the line now. You have the 10 year relationship. You have the 10 year, 15 year career. You have kids. You, you can't mess it all up. And yet why most people are feeling a lot of anxious in the world right now is that what happened during COVID and what's happening to the entire like planet right now is that there's this consciousness upgrade that's happening and people are feeling that things are shifting around them and that the one way or another, they have to make a change. But most people are getting split down the middle now between I know I need to change because something is totally different around everyone in every situation I'm dealing with right now. And yet I'm so afraid to change because it's going to cost me too much. And you've been through it. I've been through it. Like this is the, you know, you got to, or you, <laughs> you know, you just feel that anxiousness all the time. And there's this quote that says, there's no pain, like a story inside you, uh, left untold. And, um, it's the story inside of you you're meant to share. It's just to be your truest self. And so you've got to step into it. You just have to. You don't have you to. Listen. You could suffer you instead. Don't have to. Just... <laughs> Suffering is optional around here. <laughs> and many people do. And we know those people that are 70, 80 years old and you know, think about their life and say, I wish I would have and just are wrought with regret. I heard something recently that I thought was just brilliant. It was Oprah. God bless Oprah. I love mm -hmm. her podcast. Mm -hmm. Super Soul Sunday is just amazing. But she's amazing guests on it. And it was a, I can't remember the researcher's name, but she was a parenting expert. And she reminded us that your children aren't your children. They are actually their own people. And your job is to help them become the best version of their self. And that that was a really interesting switch for me as a parent to think, you know, my children and how much ego goes into wanting to raise them in a way that I want them to be when really my goal is to chaperone them to help them become the persons that they were meant to be and taking that further, putting it back on yourself for a second. You know, you were meant to be the person that you're supposed to be. And what weighs us down is responsibilities, obligations, some of, you know, our identity that's around things that we chose in life, our school mascot, or, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm this and I'm that. And suddenly it's like, okay, well, who am I at the core? How do you get to the core of who you are? What is the process for that? Because again, we spend so much time like describing our lives and our stories around where we grew up, our parents' situation, where we went to school, what job we do, but that's not who we are. That's things that perhaps are describing some of our interests in life. But how do you get to the core of who you are? Not a great question. Yeah, we should just answer that in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about 10 more minutes left, Chris, go. <laughs> Don't waste time. <laughs> I think it's really important to note that your energy will tell you everything. Right before we started recording this interview today, I was trying to make a decision in my business that will shape the next five, 10 years, honestly. 
and my director of operations asked me a question and I said, here's the way that I think we should do it. And I laid out this very clinical, really strong business plan to do it. And I had thought a lot about it for like an hour and a half last night. And then I'm like, that's the way we should do it. Here's the way I want to do it. And she goes, watching you describe what we should do compared to what way you think is the right thing to do was like night and day. Your energy with the first one was so much more subdued. It was so much more analytical. It was so much more like this is the what is the right. And when you started talking about the second, you started getting animated and I sat up differently. And I promise you, if your energy is off, if you're feeling exhausted, if you feel overwhelmed, if you're feeling like drained all the time, then you can be certain, certain that, that you, you are not walking the right path for you, right? Because actually the path that we all want to be on is one where we're truly, truly happy, right? And there's two books that I think people could really recommend as incredible guides. If you're really wanting to step into this, the first one that many people know is The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, who, you know, he he just talked about, and he's a, a researcher at Stanford. I mean, he is a very qualified, qualified person, but he spent the first, you know, 40 of his year, years of his life doing it one way. And then he spent the last whatever many years just in total bliss. And people don't believe him, but he has. And it's like, why? And he's like, he learned through research that our brains have developed over however long you want to imagine that has been to anticipate the worst possible scenario. So what we're finally reaching a place where actually you're not actually dealing with hunger every day. A lot of people listening to this, you're not dealing with a lot of stuff. Almost every stress you feel is self-induced based on your job or your thing or whatever you have, what you need. And now you can reshape your mind to start orienting it towards joy. And it can be the place because when we get too comfortable and too excited, we think something's wrong and unconsciously we do something to mess it up. And there's four ways we do it. He's so fascinating how we identify that. So one is follow your energy. Your energy will tell you where you're excited, where you want to go is kind of at the core and go there. And the second book I would just say is called the way of integrity. And it's by Martha Beck. If anyone has gotten a chance to read that, I can't recommend it enough. But that second book is just for, for her and the research she's outlined. Again, both people are PhDs. They match everything with a tremendous amount of research. She's out of Harvard. Is this, is that uh, we break from our integrity all the time. And every time we do, we split. So someone says, do you want to come to this event? Inside, you think deep down, not really. But you don't even let yourself think it. You go, sure, I'll be there, right? You don't ask yourself, do I want to be there? And that little split causes another little split and it causes another little split. And by the end of the day, you feel like you want to have a drink, not because that would bring you joy or happiness, but like you want to have some type of escape from that. It's being able to come back to every single minute of your day. Are you in your integrity? And you can make that decision now and it brings you back to center. Do I want to do that? How do I feel? What's right for me? In every single moment, if you honor your truth, it honors the people around you. So even if someone says, do you think I should do this? Or do you like, and you think it would hurt them to be honest, you can say it in a kind way, but you don't break your integrity a single bit. And that's what brings you back that. to your center. I love that. And I think that's a really great way to self-reflect. And you brought up a word earlier, like I should. And I think that's where a lot of, people have that conflict with their integrity because we do get a lot of recommendations in our world around the things that we should be doing. You should be happy. <laughs> you know, try that, like start there. You should be happy, you everything that, or, you know, they're doing this, you should be doing that too. Like, you know, if you don't have an agenda, other people have one for you and it's usually presented to you as, you know what you should do. And because you're not clear, suddenly, you're like, yeah, that sounds good. Might as well go in that. And it's funny because a lot of my coaching conversations, I get a lot of people who start with, well, what should I be doing? And I'm like, you know what? I do not know the answer to that question, but here's what I know. I've got great questions that people in your position should, you know, might be, maybe not should be asking this, but might ask themselves to help get that clarity. I can't tell you that, but I can help guide you there. And I would imagine like, you know, taking those first steps, Chris, requires that I like to think of as everyday courage, which is in contrast to how we typically talk about courage. We often talk about courage as if it's saving your platoon in combat, like some extreme physical act. I think about everyday courage to live your truth as, you know, small things like stating your boundary. I'd love to hear where your thoughts go with that. I, I think it's so true. And I, I think it's having the courage to know that you're not going to get it right. Because I think a lot of people drawn to you and drawn to me and drawn to a podcast like this or anything like that are, are, are driven. 
And I think for me as someone who's pretty driven, my biggest fear is when I mess up and then I mess up again and then I mess up again, right? Like when I make that commitment to myself, I'm not going to break my integrity. And like 30 seconds later, 30 minutes later, I find myself breaking my integrity. The pain of like making a decision and then watching yourself not be able to keep the promise to yourself is excruciating. And when you're making a big change like this, that everyday courage, to me, it, it's it's the courage to step into the fact that you're not going to always get it right. You just aren't. And then you, oh, that sucked. Let me do it again differently. Oh, that messed up. Okay, let me do it again differently. And sometimes those take months and then years and you even find yourself, holy crap, I've been trying this literally. I started doing therapy four years ago and I feel like I haven't a, a minute further. But then you look around your life and you're so much further than you were along the way towards where you wanted to be. I think those everyday courages for, for me is just like the fear to not to not be perfect in this, to say publicly to your you know, spouse or your kids, or whatever, like, I'm going to be different in this. And then for them to see that you're not right away, <laughs> you know, and you, you mess up and you let yourself mess up. And I think that's for me is the, the everyday courage that I, I think it's just like watching yourself, not get it right over and over, but no, you're, you, you know, it's just, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to get it right the next time. And the inches, right? The progress. And that's the hesitation of sometimes letting people know that you're on a change journey is because it's kind of like going to the gym after the first month. Maybe you might see a difference. Nobody else is going to see a difference. Two months, maybe your friends will start to notice. Three months, maybe others will start to notice. And then suddenly you're like, wow, what happened to you? And so it's like, well, I've been making these little milestone investments every day. And it does pay off. And you're talking something too about what I'm hearing, self-compassion. Can you talk about mm. that role in helping others, like the role of self-compassion in helping live your story? Mm. I might cry talking about it. So, um, cause I'm learning to do this. Um, you, you work with people all the time who are the same way. It, we are so hard on ourselves inside. We're just so hard on ourselves. We're just like, and I, I am so hard on myself. I hold myself to such a high standard and I'm never meeting up to that standard. And the, the self-talk inside is just like, you could be so much better than this. You could be a better father. You could be a better like leader in your company. You could be so much better. And um, I've just found that if we really start deciding that we're going to treat ourselves, where we just say, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to be a good friend to myself and I'm going to, I'm going to come up with a name and a mind for me is buddy. Hey buddy, how you doing? And I'm just going to, I'm going to just talk to myself every day, like a good friend, you know? And, and it's just like, that self-compassion, if we don't have it for ourselves, we can't have it for anyone else. We can't have it for our kids. We can't have it for other people in the world. So self, the world needs more than anything else, all of us to start being more self-compassionate. And I think so many of us think like, I'm going to be lazy if I'm more compassionate. I'm going to like let down. It's like not about that. It's like uh, develop a great relationship with yourself because here's the truth. You will never be lonely if you have yourself. That's the secret. You'll never be lonely if you have a relationship with you. And anyone who steps into this work, you start losing friends. You start losing people. You start changing your company. You start, you make changes and it feels really lonely. And at times you feel like you have no one to talk to because you're not sure where to go. Because if you step really into this work, you're finding your true self. Some of the stuff that didn't work anymore, it isn't working. And you have to develop that deep personal relationship where you're going to be in love with yourself at all costs, right? And I think it becomes so much easier to be in love with yourself. You make a promise and you keep it. You make a promise and you keep it. And one by one by one, that builds the self-compassion. But it's all about how we talk to ourselves. And it just come up with a name for yourself that is a friend and talk to yourself every day. <laughs> <laughs> that is great guidance. Oh, Chris, I wish I could give you a hug. And I hear you. And I, I think that we've been definitely, as you alluded, very similar journeys. And I liken it to... You know, we stand under an umbrella of safety and it keeps us dry. And then mm -hmm. you decide to take a step outside the umbrella, you get wet, you get cold. But what you discover is this amazing um, sense of self, identity and resiliency in the process. And last question I have, can you offer some words of encouragement for those listening in today who are hearing and, and like me are connecting on a really deep level to your words of wisdom? Could you offer them some encouragement on how to live as the main character in their story? 
Mm. You know, that actually is my background as narrative therapy is that we found that when people actually see themselves as a character in a story, they tend to make far greater decisions. And so I imagine myself watching a movie often with my life. It's like, would you, if you were in a great movie, stay in that relationship? Right? Would you? Because in a great movie, why we love movies is that the character in the movie, they go through a transformation and by the end, they're a different person. But they always have to face at every movie that's really written well, it, it, there's this part in the movie and in a script, it's called the cave, right? Or whatever. But you have to go into the innermost dark place and find what's hidden. And if you see yourself as a character in a, in, a, in a great story, just keep asking yourself, what would a great character do right now? You know, would a great character stay in this relationship? Would a great character stay in this comfortable job, even though they're miserable? Or would we see in the movie, they start making some changes? Because what will happen in your life and in a great movie is, as soon as they decide to make a change, they don't even have to do anything in their business or their work. They're in a job they don't like, they decide, I'm not doing this again. The next scene, and this will be happening in your life, they'll meet someone. They'll get into a wreck the next day and they're not like you're going to get a wreck, but they'll do something. And that person that they hit a fender bender with becomes a good friend who's like lives their totally different life and then helps them see a different way to live. And you will start meeting guides. And, and so you just answer the call, right? Every single time you have an opportunity in every great story, there's two things that have to happen. One, there's the call to adventure. And the second, mm -hmm. there's a refusal of the call. Everybody does it and every movie does it. You have this opportunity there's a part of you or, or you're, someone you call and they say, don't do it. Or you say, don't do it in your mind. You then get over that refusal of the call, step into it, and you're into the next part. You have to cross the thing. Make yourself a great story and a, and a, a great character and story, and you will live a great story. And that is incredible advice. Chris, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thanks, Angie. It's great to be with you. Oh my gosh, didn't I tell you that Chris is the best? He inspires me so much. And through our work together, now through our friendship, I constantly go back to the well just for some insight and introspection to help me learn more about me. But isn't that the journey that we're all on at this stage to expand our self-awareness? I often spend a lot of my time in the corporate space talking about leadership development. And I think people are expecting to hear words like vision and innovation and design think like these big bold things that we celebrate our leaders for but really when it comes to leadership development it's really about developing the most important leadership relationship that we're in and that is the relationship with ourselves so with that hopefully you got some nuggets in there that can help you develop that better relationship with you and get those, again, three C's of risk taking, the clarity, courage, and confidence you need to live the life you're intended to live. So my three takeaways from the conversation was first and foremost, if you're stuck with a decision and you see multiple paths, follow your energy because it's gonna be your energy that gets you through difficult times of that path. And bet on you, I write about, um, you know, life, is going to be hard. But wouldn't you rather, like no matter what path you're on, life is going to be hard. But wouldn't you rather be following your energy when you're, you know, coming up to obstacles or challenges than doing something that you're not really passionate about in the first place? So follow your energy. The second one was that most important role of self-compassion. I know you bet on you people. You are very driven, ambitious, type A personalities. Be kind to yourself. Talk to yourself like you were talking with a friend who is experiencing a similar struggle that you are. Great guidance. Finally, I love the idea of personal integrity and living the truest form of integrity with ourselves. And the fact that we may mess it up because we're humans, we're going to be imperfect. But if we can keep coming back to a place of what's my truth, how do I state my boundary? How do I move forward having greater integrity with myself? We build self-trust. And that can be amazing fuel to have the courage to live the life of our dreams. Friends, thank you so much for the conversation today. And I'd love to stay in touch. Please visit angieconnect.com. You see what we did there? We went from angiewitkowski.com to angieconnect.com because apparently Wutkowski is hard to spell. But if you go to angieconnect.com, you'll find a ton of resources, free learning tools, 
free things that you can take and reflect upon and grow and develop. Have a great day. Thank you.